Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. So good to see you guys. Glad to be back in the house of the Lord today. Are you excited to be in the house of the Lord today? Amen. There you go. I want to start off this morning with something that I normally don't take time to do, but you know, every once in a while, when we're riding down the interstate, we'll, we'll see this mile marker that means something to us. We know that, the, that, uh, that we, we've reached this part of our journey, and, and uh, we're still traveling the journey that we're on, right? Well, we've got a major mile marker today in the house. Miss Carolyn Lucky is 80 years young. So I think that's worthy of a happy birthday. What y'all think? Here we go. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. Amen. There you go. That's right. And many more. Amen. Well, glad to have all of you this morning. And if I missed your birthday, I am so sorry. But, uh, but, but bless you if you've had a birthday sometime in the last four or five years, because we just don't <laughs> normally do this. So happy birthday, everybody. There you go. There you go. Well, good to see all of you. Let me uh, take just a few minutes and go through uh, some announcements. But before I do that, just let me welcome you again to the service. It is good to have all of you today. And uh, so good that you've braved the cold air. I think we're supposed to get a little co uh, warmer today. So, But thank you for being here today. It's good to see all of you. Got some good weather coming up, I think, uh, today and tomorrow. Then couple more days with some rain or something, but, uh, but good to see all of you. Thank you for being here. If you're joining us on Facebook Live, so good to have y'all. Sorry we missed you guys last week. We had a, a technical difficulty back there that uh, we have since gotten uh, taken care of. So thank you for being a part of our worship services. Don't, don't go away from us. We just, we just accidentally missed one last week due to something that was beyond our control. So glad to have you back with us today. So good that you are choosing to be with us. If you're visiting for the first time today, there is a visitor's card or connect card. I think we all look like home folk today, but um, those cards are there for you as for, so we can have a record of your visit. Uh, a few things that we would like to go through with you. Don't forget, uh, Tasha, this is this coming Thursday, right? The seniors. Okay. This coming Thursday, we're having our senior sing-along luncheon, uh, which is uh, at 1130 this coming um, this coming Thursday, and we don't necessarily have a sign-up sheet for that that I'm aware of, so um, if you consider yourself a senior, just come. We will make sure that we have the accommodations for you, but this is going to be a really good one, and uh, they all are, but it's just this week, this, this time we have Miss Barbara Walker, who is coming to uh, sing for us, and I'm excited about this. I have not yet met her, but I have met her husband, who is Cleve Walker, and he is an employee of uh, WAFJ over in North Augusta. So it's a pleasure to have uh, her come and sing for us. I hear that she is an awesome singer, has a wonderful spirit about her, so I'm anxious to meet her and, uh, and listen to her as she comes and sings. So come and be with us that day. We want you to be here and uh, enjoy that time of fellowship together. I also don't forget, this is a few weeks out, but I want to mention it now. We usually give you a couple of weeks notice on this. Uh, according to the bylaws, but I think this may be three weeks, but our quarterly conference is coming up, and we have to have those every quarter, obviously, and our next one is February the 13th, so come and be a part of that on February the 13th as we have our quarterly conference. It'll be just a few minutes after our morning worship. We will get together and do that, and uh, also don't forget tonight. Um, tonight we have our I Am a Church Member class that is continuing, and uh, last week we had two couples that were able to get here uh, that weren't too afraid of the weather, and, uh, and they're both from way up north, so they weren't too worried about the, the couple of flurries that might fall. But, uh, but anyway, we just decided that we would have a, a time of uh, fellowship last week and, and a prayer time together. So we did not do session two last week, which is actually uh, really session one. The first session was an introduction. So you haven't missed a thing. 
So come tonight and, uh, and be a part of that. Is, uh, that is a really important session. So come and be a part of that one tonight as we discuss that together. Our church Valentine banquet is coming up February the 12th, and I have been hearing some, uh, some really good plans for this. So this is going to be fun, and uh, it's going to be in the evening this year. We're going to have this at 6.30, and uh, it'll be fun. There'll be some entertainment, uh, some great food, and some great fellowship. So come and be a part of that. Bring your sweetheart. If you don't have one, you've got a couple of weeks to find one. So bring somebody with you, okay? Bring your cat. No, don't bring any cats. Let's don't do that. And uh, there are some other opportunities for service there that you will see. And uh, make sure that you uh, are in, in, uh, in uh, coming to, to be a part of those. Sorry, I've got COVID brain this morning. It uh, does that to me sometimes. It's been, it's been over a year since I've had COVID, and this fog still has not gone away. Every once in a while, it sneaks up on me. So anyway, it, is it? <laughs> it doesn't get any better. Amen. Oh, my goodness. But, uh, any further announcements this morning? Well, the year is kicking off great. We've got several things that are going. I know that our um, events and our outreach committee is going to be meeting very soon. And there's some things that are going to be going on this year at the church that we've never done before. And uh, we're just excited on how God is going to use more information to come. So keep plugged in. Stay tuned. Okay. Anything further? Let's pray together. Lord, we're just grateful once again to be in your house. And uh, what an honor it is that we get to come and serve you today. And and I'll just dedicate this to you. So, Father, we just pray that everything that's said and everything that's done will just reflect you and I'll just reflect your majesty today. So, Lord, we thank you. We give you praise for what you're going to do. And uh, we just praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. Let's sing a great song called, Lord, Reign in Me. Let's sing. i 
today that the Lord rings in your life. Amen. Give him a hand clap of praise this morning. Amen. Well, let's take a few minutes. Let's fellowship one with another. Go around, shake some hands. Tell everybody that you and Jesus love them. to your seats. Let's sing this great praise chorus because my life is in you, Lord. Let's sing this together. Let's sing this together. One, two, sing. My life is in you, Lord. My strength is in you. Jesus within you. Give him a hand clap of praise this morning. Amen. You may be seated. One announcement that I forgot to make this morning is the fact that next Sunday uh, we're going to have a presentation from our uh, weary travelers who went to, to Gatlinburg last uh, weekend and uh, they made it back safely. Thank the Lord for that. And uh, they have some things that they want to share with you about their trip just to tell you a little bit about that. So make sure that you're here next week and say, come and uh, tell us all about what Jesus did while they were there. So remain seated. Let's sing a couple of great hymns this morning. Here's a good one. It's called All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. Let's sing this.
ransom from the fall. Hail Him who saved you by His grace and crowned Him Lord of all. Hail Him who saved you by His grace and crowned Father, we're just so grateful for these old hymns that we have that uh, we can go to to get this rich theology that, uh, that we've been taught all of our lives. and So scripture loaded. Father, just songs that we can go to to sing your praise and sing of your mercy and grace. We're just grateful for it. Lord, we thank you for our church. Uh, Lord, we know you want to do mighty things here. We just feel your hand even now. So, Lord, we're just so grateful that you love us. We're grateful that you have our hands on us, have your hands on us, Father. We want to follow you. So, Lord, just bless us as we strive to do that. We start veering one way or another. I just pray that you put us back in line. Just keep us with our eyes focused on you. Lord, we have many in our church that are still out today with illnesses. And we have some that are out due to deaths in the family and traveling and just so many of our people are uh, dealing with things in their life right now. So, Father, I just ask a blessing on each and every one of those that we have claimed as prayer requests. We just ask, Lord, that, uh, that you just touch them and heal them in a mighty way. Keep them safe as they travel and bring them back to us, Lord, as we continue your work here at Cornerstone. Lord, we thank you for this time we have to receive an offering. We just pray, Lord, that, uh, that you will bless every cent that is given today and that is used to build the kingdom of God here. Lord, you know our needs. We just ask that you meet our needs on a daily and weekly and monthly basis, yearly basis. Father, we just know that, um, that you can use us in a mighty way. So we just ask Lord, that you do that. We thank you. We give you praise. And it's in Jesus we pray. Amen.
Amen. Thank you, Suzanne. Here's a song. It's uh, one that I have loved dearly over the years, and it's been quite some time uh, since I sang this song here at Cornerstone. So y'all just pray with me as we sing this together. So it's called Fill My Cup, Lord. Let's sing it. Like the woman at the well, I was seeking for things that could not satisfy. But then I heard. My Savior speaking, draw from my well that never shall run dry. If you would, let's sing a little more this morning. Let's lift up the name of Jesus on high today. Let's sing this together. Let's sing. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. So glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. Sing it. You 
Jesus, sing this with me. Are you past the point of weary? Is your burden weighing heavy? Is it all too much to carry? Let me tell you about my Jesus. Do you feel that empty feeling? Cause shame's done all it's stealing. And you're desperate for some healing. Let me tell you about my Jesus. Sing this. He makes a way when there ain't no way. He rises up from the empty grave. There ain't no sinner that he can't save. Let me tell you about my Jesus. His love is strong and his grace is free. And the good news is I know that he can do for you what he's done for me. Let me tell you about my Jesus. And let my Jesus change your life. Hallelujah, 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 amen, amen. Who can wipe away the tears from broken dreams and wasted years and tell the past to disappear? Oh, and let me tell you about my Jesus and all the wrong turns that you would go and undo if you could. Who can work it out all your good? Oh, and let me tell you about my Jesus. He makes a way when there ain't no way. He rises up from an empty grave. There ain't no sinner that he can't say. Let me tell you about my Jesus. His love is strong and his grace is free. And the good news is I know that he can do for you what he's done for me. Let me tell you about my Jesus And let my Jesus change your life Hallelujah Hallelujah Hallelujah, amen, amen Who would take my 
my cross to Calvary, pay the price for all my guilty. Who would care that much about me? Let me tell you about my Jesus. And he makes a way where there ain't no way. Rises up from the empty grave. There ain't no sinner that he can't save. Let me tell you about my Jesus. His love is strong and his grace is free. And the good news is I know that he can do for you what he's done for me. Let me tell you about my Jesus. And let my Jesus change your life. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. Amen. Sing hallelujah. 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 And let my Jesus change your life. Give the Lord a hand this morning. Amen. I tell you what, guys, we're just going to be seated right here. And uh, Billy, we're just going to move on to the message right here. Well, good morning again. Make sure I can hear you up here. <laughs> Amen. I tell you what, let me tell you what my Jesus did for me. What a song. Amen. Goodness gracious. Doesn't get much better. That's why I cut the last song. Yeah. Great day. Might as well just stop right there. Y'all, we just have an invitation to go home. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. I, I, I just, I got to tell you all this. Lisa, and she was not feeling well today. She left a little early. But we missed y'all last week. It is, it is tough to not be here. I mean, you know, we, we were where we needed to be. We went to see Jared off, and, and um, Lisa watched him until she could no longer see the taillights on the bus that was leaving the arena that they were at. So, but um, anyway, he was, he was excited. He was, he was good to go, so to speak, and um, just seemed like a really first-class operation. But, but, uh, but anyway, that was good. But we missed y'all. We got back Sunday Afternoon, about 2 or 2.30, the weather was not all that bad. Once we got over on the other side of Columbia, we saw some of the icing in the trees, and, you know, they were starting to bend a little bit, and it was just really beautiful to look at it, 90 miles, an, um, 70 miles an hour going by. <laughs> then on the way back, we noticed that some of the trees had actually broken, so I mean, the ice gets heavy, so I know some of y'all are really familiar with that. But, but I understand that Brother Joe and Brother Albert Henson did a wonderful job. So thank you all for coming and helping us with that and uh, just being willing servants to, to come and serve the Lord. So that is awesome. So thank you all. Well, um, Sunday uh, before last, we began a new sermon series and we began on the uh, pastoral epistle of Titus. You can go ahead and flip over there. We'll be in, using some of the same scripture that we used last uh, a couple of weeks ago in chapter one. We'll get to that. But um, Paul wrote this letter to this man named Titus who was a lot like Timothy in ways that he was his protege. Uh, Paul was teaching him to take over some of the churches that he had began to start, and uh, he was teaching him everything that he possibly could to do that. Um, Titus was living and working on this island of Crete. If you'll remember that, Greek island there, Crete, and he was facing a lot of adversity. They were having a time out there trying to get these churches going, and again, Paul had, had tasked him, and I use that word because it was a task, he had tasked him to finish this work that he had begun when he was in Crete, starting these churches. So we said a couple of weeks ago, Titus was having great difficulty. There was adversity uh, working with these Cretan people. Uh, Paul had, had left his shoes untied, so to speak. There was a lot of things that he had, had left for Titus to do. There was just other places that he needed to be. So there were some things left undone. And he was relying on Titus to, to finish this work that he had begun that the Lord had been telling him about. And he wanted him, wanted him to get these churches up and running and headed in the right direction. That's basically what his task was. So, But over time, Titus had become discouraged. He was dealing with discouragement, wasn't getting the cooperation that he needed to be getting. There were a lot of people that were fighting against him, having uh, different things that were going on in their lives that were causing him difficulty. 
And um, he was fighting against also those who were uh, teaching against uh, the laws of God. And they were teaching, instead of grace, they were teaching Jewish law. So these were things that, uh, that he was just having difficulty doing. So his task was great. He had a lot of obstacles that would come that he had to deal with. They were difficult, but, but Titus would begin to teach and exhort the name of the Lord. And uh, he would do that as he was putting into action the plan that Paul had left for him. So let's refresh our memory for just a moment as we read again from Titus chapter 1, uh, verses 5 through 9. And again, Paul is addressing Titus. So stand with me if you would. We'll read again Titus chapter 1, verses 5 through 9. Everybody got it? Got it? Say, I got it. Okay, it says this. The reason I left you in Crete was that you might put in order what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town as I have directed you. An elder must be blameless, faithful to his wife, a man whose children believe and are not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient. Since an overseer manages God's household, he must be blameless, not overbearing, not quick-tempered, not given to drunkenness, not violent, not pursuing dishonest gain. Rather, he must be hospitable, one who loves what is good, one who is self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. Let's pray together. Lord, again, for this scripture that we have, it's just an honor to have your word this morning to go to, to get some instruction on how our uh, pastors uh, should be, Father, as we uh, preach from your pulpit. So, Lord, we thank you for this. Just help us as a church to understand and uh, what our role is as a church in this as well. So we give you praise, and we want to honor you through it. It's in Jesus we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. Well, again, we'll see here, if you will notice that several of these um, descriptive phrases here in Titus are a mirror image of what we see over in Timothy. When Timothy is giving the qualifications for deacon and pastors and elders, all these kinds of things, this kind of mirrors it. Just really quick, I've got this on the screen for you. You can flip over there if you want to, but 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. Uh, just to show you how they mirror each other, it reads this way. Now the overseer is to be above reproach. Remember seeing that just a moment ago? Above reproach, faithful to his wife, we've heard that. Uh, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach. Not given to drunkenness, not violent, but gentle. Not quarrelsome and not a lover of money. So we see that. And then if you were to continue to read verses 4 to 7 there in Timothy, you would see that those qualifications even continue. So just the mirror part there is what we wanted to look at. Now, I wanted to point this out, and there's a good reason to do this. God was inspiring Paul to write these words in both of these epistles. This was the inspiration of the Lord through Paul to Timothy and to Titus. What's important to notice here is the writing is the same. The writing's exactly the same. There's no variance in this part of those epistles to Timothy and Titus. And I got to thinking about that and got to thinking about how that applies to us today and the fact that these standards on the island of Crete were the same as the standards were over in Ephesus where Timothy was shows us that God's measuring stick doesn't move. God's measuring stick stays the same no matter where we are. And what God requires from its leadership in the big city church, is exactly the same as the leadership that he has in the rural church. It's all exactly the same. Both places need godly men who are willing to talk about the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what it's for. Doesn't matter if the church is large or small. Doesn't matter if the church has a $20 million facility or if they meet in somebody's garage. It's all the same. The standards are just consistently high. There's nothing low about these standards. They're consistently high, and they do not change based on location or circumstance. So as Paul was telling Titus that he needed to finish this work, he gave him this list of qualifications that he was looking at. So let's just take a look at these. 
Before we do that, I want to mention this. Paul never tells Titus that a pastor has to be perfect. Did you notice that? If you didn't read that, please. (laughs) Make a little note somewhere. In reality, pastors and elders, whatever you call them, we're just sinners too. That's all we are. All of us. We live far from a perfect world. We all have our moments. But we're called by God to this position. And there's several things that just aren't negotiable. So let's see. Paul says that we must live blamelessly or beyond accusation is what some of the, of the uh, versions will say. Other translations like what we read today say above reproach. Paul's saying here that these men must have no sinful, now listen, no sinful defect in their life. That doesn't mean we're not sinners. But we don't need a sinful defect in our lives that will cost us our virtue. It shouldn't cost us our righteousness. It can't cost us our godliness. There must not be anything in their lives that would disqualify them as being morally and spiritual examples to others. That's what he's saying. What he's saying is this. Not only should they teach rightly, they have to live rightly. These men who have been called by God must set an example of living godly lives, and then teach them, listen, with sound, everybody say sound, sound doctrine, to set the correct pattern for believers to follow. Now, mistakenly, there's some pastors that see their role totally different from this. Some of them see themselves as promoters. Go with me a minute. Some see themselves as a businessman or maybe even an executive. Some see themselves as a psychologist or maybe even a psychiatrist in some instances. Some see themselves as an entertainer. Maybe even the president of the organization. Now this is a pretty stark contrast to what the Bible says. In 2 Timothy chapters 2 and 3, we are depicted as faithful men who carry on the ministry. We should be faithful teachers. We should be soldiers who are on active duty. That's who we are. We should be athletes who compete according to the rules. We should be hardworking farmers, the Scriptures tell us. We should be careful workers. We should be useful vessels. And we should be bondservants to Jesus Christ. Now there's nothing particularly glamorous about these descriptions that I've just given you. All of them require intense effort and self-sacrifice. The role of the pastor or the elder is certainly not one of high status like the president of an organization may be. Sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ and all that we do to prepare for that, listen, is about Him, not about us. He must be high and lifted up. And listen, we've got to get this right. Pastors have to get this right. We have to put our focus on the right things. We've got to keep our priorities straight. Some of our responsibilities, listen, are to win the lost people to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Then we also must nourish and disciple our church family who are already believers. We must preach and teach, what was that word a minute ago? Sound doctrine. We must help our committees with organizations so that they can be equipped to do their jobs. We must help our church leaders make wise, biblical, and financial decisions that affect our church family. We should pray earnestly and consistently for the well-being of our church family and the lost people of the world. And when discipline is due, we must discipline, as the Bible tells us. And then we also must ordain our qualified leaders. This isn't about status. 
It's about Jesus. We have to keep it that way. Another word for a pastor, and you'll know this, is shepherd. It's another word for it. Shepherds certainly didn't have a high status, did they? They were at the bottom of the heap. They were servants, which is what we are. Listen, we can't do any of these things properly if we are not living above reproach. Another thing Paul mentions to Titus is the leader must be faithful to his wife. Some versions say the husband of one wife. There's varying opinions on what this means. There are some churches who are completely against a man who was divorced, serving as a pastor, and even a deacon for that matter. Let's look at this and hopefully clear this up. The Greek defines this one husband of one wife as this. The Greek clears it up by saying a one woman man. That's how it's listed. And this definition has left some to misinterpret it. When we think of polygamy, for example, which back in these days, that was a severe problem. When we think about polygamy, this was not Paul's point in this message. And even though the New Testament clearly forbids polygamy, this not only applies to pastors, it applies to everybody. He also isn't referring to widowers here. It's perfectly permissible to remarry if you have been widowed. Let's remember that Paul himself was an apostle. We have no indication that he was ever married. He's not saying that an elder has to be married. When referring to divorced pastors, there are exceptions to this that most of the time are misinterpreted and not acknowledged. Although God hates divorce, He's gracious to permit it under circumstances. I've got under certain circumstances, I've got this on the screen for you. Malachi chapter 2, verse 16. The Lord who hates, uh, the man who hates and divorces his wife, says the Lord. The God of Israel does violence to the one he should protect, says the Lord Almighty. So be on your guard and do not be unfaithful. Jesus said that the adultery of one spouse permitted the innocent partner to remarry. Let's look at verse five, uh, chapter 5, 32 of Matthew. It says, But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, makes her the victim of adultery. And anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Paul also taught that if an unbelieving spouse leaves, let him leave. The other party is not under bondage in such cases. 1 Corinthians 7.15 says this, But if the unbeliever leaves, let it be so. The brother or sister is not bound in such circumstances. God has called us to live in peace. The husband of one wife, from everything that I can see about this, from what the scripture is telling me, is referring to the man's faithfulness to the woman that he is married to. There are no allowances for sexual impurity. Now, I don't want to bore you today with going through this entire list of qualifications. I know that you're intelligent, that you have the ability to comprehend this. I just want you to see and have a grasp on them. And we talked about being blameless. We talked about being the husband of one wife. There's nine other qualifications that Paul mentions here. He mentions having faithful children. His children must be believers. If he cannot lead his own child in his own household to Christ... What success is he going to have with someone he doesn't know? You see, 1 Timothy 3.5 says that Christian living and Christian service, listen, must begin in the home. I'm going to get to that. Lisa and I have both been in Christian education now for many years. and We both, we both taught at our previous church of school and now she's teaching uh, just a few miles down the road at a church here in Aiken. And, of course, I'm here with all of you. But teaching in a private Christian school certainly has its advantages. You can imagine, and Adrian's part of this as well. And I know we have some homeschoolers 
that, that do all of this, but those in public school are on a different plane. But teaching in a private uh, Christian school, you get to work in an environment that publicly acknowledges the Lord, and in most cases, you're surrounded by other Christians. What we've noticed through the years is that not all of the students that come to the Christian schools come from a Christian home. Some of these children are at the Christian school because they have had discipline problems or other issues at the public school. So they have to have a place for them to go. The smaller Christian environment, there's another advantage to this because there's smaller classes. There is more time for one-on-one teaching there. It also gives less opportunity for discipline type problems, although you still have those. But this isn't always true for all of them. And I've seen some crazy stuff even in the Christian schools. Some of these students, again, have not grown up in a Christian home. They may be well behaved. They might get their work. But they haven't been taught about the gospel of Jesus Christ inside the home. We're so thankful for the opportunities we've had to be able to tell them about Jesus. There's only so much we can do. We don't have the ability to follow up in the home. We've had to learn that our job is to plant the seed, water it every day that we get an opportunity to do so, and then let God have the harvest. What a mission field that is. God has provided a way to minister to a child who would never have heard it in the home. For the pastor, he must teach his children about Jesus. And he must lead them to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. The children who live in the pastor's home should also be good examples of what we see out of obedience. There's no such thing as a perfect child. We know that. For you parents who think that your child may be perfect, (laughs) sorry. (laughs) Love them dearly. We fail, we sin, we miss the mark. As pastors, we have moments in our lives that are just plain ugly. We all fall into this category. These verses, though, go on to tell us that these pastors or elders should not be overbearing. We shouldn't live with arrogance or use our leadership role to extinguish the Spirit of God. We should not use arrogance to extinguish the abilities of others. A pastor who is overbearing can actually cause division in in his own church. He can remove the unity that God has provided. We should also not be quick-tempered. Anger comes from pride. Being quick to anger shows immaturity and it clouds the pastor's leadership abilities. We should not be given to drunkenness. This reference is about control. You cannot be fit to exercise authority of someone else if you cannot control yourself. For me, I can't think of any instance where it would be okay for a pastor to be found in a drunken state unless anesthesia for a surgery. I can't think of any other reason. We shouldn't pursue dishonest gain, it says. We should not be dishonest in how we handle our own finances. To be a lover of money can clown our judgment. It calls us to lose sight of what really matters through the cross of Jesus Christ. 
Now those are the negative qualities of the pastor. There's also some positive qualities that we must have. We must be hospitable. We must be lovers of what is good. Whatever is good is whatever benefits others. We must have self-control. We must be upright by having pure conduct before others. We must be holy. What that means is we have a cleansed heart before the Lord. We have a, a wonderful relationship with the Lord. We must be disciplined, exercising control in every aspect of life. And then we also must be trustworthy. There are things that come the pastor's way on a daily basis that they're entrusted with. Church members, people outside of the church will talk with the pastor trusting that that, that conversation stays with them and the Lord. The pastor also must be trusted to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ uninhibited and for the Lord's glory. Now folks, according to this passage, and there's a lot here, this is who pastors should be. We aren't called to be perfect, but we are called to be willing. Willing servants. And for us as Christians, I think we all have a responsibility in this. Although this book of Titus was written with pastors in mind, it's also important that the church has an understanding of it. I could give you a brief illustration that will help you understand why you need to understand this. I have a close friend that lives in another town. Their church is searching for a pastor even now. Have been for quite some time. It seems that there has just been obstacle after obstacle after obstacle. They just have not been able to get comfortable with a new pastor for the church. Well, my friend called me the other day. He was explaining some of these things and probably even venting a little bit, you know, about how things were going. And that's okay with me. It's part of the, the relationship of a friend to listen to each other when we need to do that. I haven't found the opportunity yet, but I, I think I've got a pretty good idea of what's going on. I think I might be able to put my finger at least on part of it. See, they had a long-time pastor. Everybody loved him. He was there for a long time, many, many years. Well, he retired. He had a tremendous ministry there because he allowed God to be the minister. He preached the Word. He had this charisma about him that was a genuine part of his personality. What you saw with him is what you got every time. He didn't put on a show. He consistently met these qualifications that we see on a, on a pretty consistent basis that we see from Timothy and Titus. His sermons were exciting. He was, he was an energetic guy. He was all over the, the stage area. His sermon delivery was, I would call it impeccable. You couldn't, you couldn't take your eyes and your ears off of the guy. I mean, he had you right here. If you took your ears or your eyes off of him, there was, there was a fear that you might miss something. In and out of the pulpit, he, he checked all the boxes. He was the right man in the right church at the right time. My friend said to me the other day that he would like to have a new pastor that would let go of the pulpit and move around a little bit while he was preaching. And knowing what I know about this situation... I couldn't help but wonder if what he was saying was, I want someone exactly like who we had before, or maybe even the same guy. In that moment in time that I had with him, with that 20 minutes on the telephone, it didn't appear 
that anything in this passage of Scripture that we discuss today has even been considered by this church. I, I, I really pray that I'm wrong about it. And listen, there's nothing wrong with a pastor with charisma. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, if, if there is a church that is looking for a pastor, I would encourage them to find someone with a little bit of spunk as long as he's spunky about preaching the gospel. There's preachers out there that can hold your attention for hours, but they don't say nothing. Did that get on Facebook Live? <laughs> Amen. That's right. Listen, our churches, our congregations deserve to know the truth. They need solid Christian men that will tell them the truth. If they can do that and hold your attention while they're doing it, you better sign them up as quick and as long as they meet these qualifications on a consistent basis. Y'all, I'm just kind of getting out there today. Something else bothers me. You want to hear it? Something else that bothers me is how churches advertise for their pastoral openings. I could go on about this for days. But this is relevant to you. I, I want you to know this. There's websites, there's other publications that advertise openings for pastors, music directors, um, um, mission people and um, secretaries, all these things. No, nobody advertises for secretaries. So, so, so no need to look. It's, you know, it's not out there. Hours of spill. Hours of spill. So you don't need to be looking anywhere else. So. When you look at some of these, though, you would expect to see some of that. Wouldn't you? I can tell you that more often than not, that's not what you see. Qualifications usually in, include education, which is important. They usually include some sort of minimum time of service, service which is important. You need somebody with a little experience, somebody that knows a few things. But then it'll include some ridiculous things. I saw one recently that said... Playing golf is not a requirement, but it is a plus. <laughs> Research. Researching this message. Seriously. Seriously, though, listen to this. We see this kind of stuff, and then we wonder why the church at large is struggling. <laughs> it isn't struggling, listen, because God is taking a break from it all. It's struggling because we don't know and we don't exercise the Word of God. That's why it struggles. It's struggling because we either want to put unrealistic or completely inadequate expectations on our pastors. Our churches today need to take their focus off of what they get out of their pastors and put their focus on what they can put into their pastors. Amen. You want your church to grow? Pray for your pastor. You want the right kind of pastor in your churches? Hire who is qualified by these qualifications, not on how much he jumps around, not on whether he wears skinny jeans and has a beard, wears a cross on the outside of his necklace. Our churches need to hire the right pastor. Hire the one, listen, that'll tell you about Jesus. That's who you need to hire. Tell them, tells everybody that Jesus died for their sin, that he rose three days later to offer you everlasting life in a place called heaven. You want the right guy? Get that guy. He won't disappoint you. So today as we close, 
get fired up about this stuff. Give me a sip of water. Titus is a great book. I want you to know this, coming from me. Here's where my heart lies. I want you to know Jesus. That's what I want you to know. I want you to have a relationship with him and be plugged in tight to his word and to who he is, the person of Jesus Christ. So maybe you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior. And it's possible. I know we're mostly home folk today. I know all of you on a personal level. But maybe there's somebody here today that's been playing church. Maybe there's somebody here that in passing said something to Jesus about saving. Wasn't any real meaning behind it. Today's an opportunity for you to make that right. Maybe you're certain that you do know Jesus as your Savior. But you haven't been living the life that He would have you live. You can make that right today too. Right where you are, you can ask Him to either save you as a lost child or right where you are, you can say, Lord, I know that I'm saved. But I haven't been living. I want to rededicate my life to you. You can do those things today. So as we close, I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet. Don't waste any time. I want you to come today. Maybe there's something you just need to pray about. Maybe there's something that's on your heart. Our altar is open. So don't waste any time. You come this morning as Suzanne plays. Remember, wherever he leads is where I'll go. We'd like to thank you for joining us on Facebook Live this morning. I truly hope that you've been blessed by something that's been said this morning. We just want to glorify the Lord here at Cornerstone. I pray that you've made a decision for Jesus Christ today. If you don't know him, I pray that you have come to know him this morning as your personal Savior. If you have, drop us a line. You can go to cbcaken.com backslash contact. And you can leave me a message there. You can send me an email. It'll come directly to me. And that will let me know exactly what your decision for the Lord was. If you just need a prayer request, anything like that that you may need, that's a great place for you to go to do that. So join us again. We'll be live again on Facebook Live next Sunday morning at 1045. And then also on Wednesday nights, we're live at 630 for a Bible study. So join us. We'd love to see you there. Have a great, great day.